this last lecture, I'm going to finally tackle head on uh, this strange mental problem, which has been at the center of much discussion in uh, quantum condensed matter physics for over 20 years. Uh, so last time we talked about uh, really the simplest solvable model of a metal without any quasi particles, uh, and that's the SYK model. And uh, we showed, you know, uh, I, I, I showed how you could solve it in a particular large n limit. Um, and we found interesting properties at low temperature, including uh, this uh, Planckian time scaling of typical relaxation times. Um, I also showed connection to, out, uh, to time reparameterization symmetry, uh, which has opened uh, a lot of uh, exciting work on uh, uh, applications to black holes, which I will not go into at all. Uh, anyway, okay, so now we're going to take some of those uh, insights from the SYK model and apply it to a realistic model where we start with a Fermi surface. You know, the fundamental feature of a metal uh, is a Fermi surface, um, but in almost all metals, uh, the traditional metals, uh, the Fermi surface is very well, it has a sharp quasi-particle excitation. And now we want to think what happens when the quasi-particles interact so strongly with each other that you lose uh, the very existence of the quasi-particles. But as we see, uh, you can lose quasi-particles, but you won't lose the Fermi surface. So that's one of the things I want to show you uh, in the first part of my discussion today. Anyway, are there any questions uh, left over from last time before I start this new discussion? There is a, uh, a spin model, which is called so, P-spin glass, which has uh, yes. spin glass behavior, which is very yes. similar with, uh, with your SYK model. Is there any any difference or any connection between these two? Like if I have the P spin model and I have P equals four, this is like your SYK model. Yes, uh, so that's a great question. So let me write down the P spin model. So the P spin model is degree of freedom in the P spin model. In fact, the word P, the spin is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, I would call it a P rotor model. So the model is you have some rotor degree of freedom uh, with some interactions, J phi J L, phi I, phi J, phi K, phi L. Uh, then you have some, some potential for each of the phi I. That counts. But the important thing is in the Lagrangian. Subir, Subir, please take, take note that that part we don't see very well. So that the edge. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. No problem, no problem. We can see, we can see because. Uh, I will draw a line to stop me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Where is the last phi, basically? Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, maybe I can also shift this a little bit uh, the other way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, but the most important thing about the P spin, quote unquote, model is the kinetic energy. Uh, which is d phi i d tau square. So, so this phi degree of freedom is not really a quantum spin. Uh, so if I just take one site, on one site, uh, you have really uh, some phi degree of freedom and some potential. So you could imagine there's some potential V of phi uh, and phi is some particle with a mass which is moving somewhere in the minimum of the potential. And this potential here is a sphere in whatever dimension that you happen to be living in. So it's really like a particle moving on a sphere. And what is the spectrum? Let's imagine it's a two dimensional sphere. What is the spectrum of a sphere? Well, of a particle on a sphere. Well, the spectrum of a particle on a sphere has energy as a moment of inertia. Uh, times L into L plus one, with degeneracy to L plus one. So you have a non-degenerate ground state with L equals zero. Uh, and then you have a triply degenerate excited state, L equals one, and so on. But the most important feature uh, is that a single site has a trivial ground state, just L equals zero. Now this is very different from, uh, well, uh, 
you know, the fermionic model I talked about um, or the original SY model, which had quantum spin. If you had a quantum spin, you have a two-fold degenerate uh, ground state of each site, spin up and spin down. Or if you have fermions, you again have two possible states, no fermion or fermion, and so on. So there's a local degeneracy uh, that's present in this model uh, that's uh, very different from the SYK or related models. Uh, there's really, uh, you know, there's some, the, it built into the structure of the space is the fact that the quantum ground state can be just trivial. Every particle just goes into the L equals zero state. There's no such state for the SYK model or the SY model. Uh, and that's why in the quantum limit, uh, this model has a very trivial phase diagram. So as a function of the coupling function here, uh, as a function of G, uh, let's say we are T equals zero. This is the zero temperature. And as a function of G, there's a spin glass phase. Um, and the, the, the quantum fluctuations give you a trivial ground state. Uh, whereas in the SYK or SY model, uh, you know, the SY model, you could have a spin glass phase under certain parameters, but, you, but there is no trivial state. And it's this state, this is a spin liquid state, or uh, so this is not equal to this. The spin liquid state and the uh, exotic states we are studying, or non fermi liquids, if you wish, uh, are really what appears here. So, so that's a big difference. The, the quantum part of the Eastern model uh, is, is, I mean, it has an interesting spin glass phase, and it's very useful to study quantum effects within the spin glass phase. But once you get out of the spin glass phase, it doesn't give you anything interesting. You mentioned that the SYK can have uh, for some uh, range of parameters spin glass phases, right? Uh, yes, yes. How and so well, when? not the SYK. It's, uh, it's the original SY model. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. I didn't describe it, but uh, it's possible. Or if you take a TJ model, which is SYK like, you can also have a spin glass phase, and in fact a transition out of a spin glass phase into a non perfect liquid phase. Uh, we're just writing a paper on that, in fact. Um, but the short answer to your question is that the P-spin quantum uh, uh, model is a very useful model to study quantum effects within the spin glass phase. Once you get out of the spin glass phase, it does not give you anything interesting. Uh, at least from my point of view, it doesn't give you a non-trivial state without quasi particles. It's really just a trivial state with L equals one excitations, and that L equals one excitation is a perfectly good quasi particle moving in some disordered background. Okay, thank you. And could I ask something more? Is there a generalization of the SYK model to different number of uh, so fermion interactions, like the spin P spin model? Can I have three spin three fermion interactions, five, six, or? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, there are, so that's been studied. It's called Q, that, uh, that's the SYK Q model, as if people call it. Yeah, uh, and as Q goes to infinity, there's a simplification, uh, just as, as this model also has a simplification as P goes to infinity. Yeah, so there's a lot of work on that. Uh, uh, I think there's some references in the notes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so to summarize here, the, another way to say this is that in a rotor model, the different components of phi commute with each other. Whereas in a spin model, the different SX and SY don't commute with each other. And that's what leads to non-trivial uh, degeneracies. Or and I get another way to say, in a spin model, uh, there's a West Zemino term, something like A of phi dot D phi D tau. If you add this very phase term to this model, then you will get the SYK like behavior. So it's missing this West Zemino term. So okay. you say like, I, if I have a, this uh, P spin model kind of with uh, the, uh, the Vesumino term, then I can map to the SYK model? Yes, to the SY model. It will become pretty much like the SY model. Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, so let's start the topic here. So as I said earlier, the, the basic feature of a metal um, is a Fermi surface. So you have some uh, fermions or electrons of dispersion epsilon of K uh, with the chemical potential absorbed in it. And the Fermi surface for free electron is just the line uh, epsilon of K uh, equals zero. Um, and uh, these states are occupied uh, and the epsilon K is less than zero. Uh, and they're empty even epsilon is zero. So that's the free fermion metal. Now you put in interactions as in Fermi liquid theory. Uh, and the way you can describe the system is by a Green's function. So you have G of omega and K. Uh, let me write it down for real frequency. There will be some omega minus epsilon of K minus the self energy of K and omega. Uh, and the self energy has a feature uh, that at T equals zero, uh, the imaginary part of the self energy, in fact, at all K, and, and as omega tends to zero, uh, is zero. Uh, so this is basically a statement of energy conservation. You have some excitation that wants to decay to some other excitation. There isn't any phase space for, uh, 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 you know, the phase space for that excitation has become weaker and weaker. Uh, and so the imaginary part of the self energy uh, at zero temperature goes to zero. This will actually be true. It's also true for the SYK model. Uh, it should also be true for non Fermi liquid for itself. It's a very general regard. Okay, uh, so because of this feature, uh, then you notice that, uh, so the self energy is purely real uh, and the Green's function has a pole. And therefore you can now define the Fermi surface uh, is defined by, uh, by the pole condition that G inverse of omega tends to zero of K equals zero uh, so this determines a special set of K. Uh, so this determines, it's one equation for three variables to so determine the surface, uh, determines K on the Fermi surface. So that's formally how you define a Fermi surface. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're at very low frequency. There's a special set of momentum. It's a very sharp surface, it's precisely defined. In fact, even for non Fermi liquids, as we'll see. Okay. Um, but then the interesting question is what is the behavior, especially of the imaginary part of sigma, at small omega? Uh, and in a Fermi liquid, um, if you look at Sigma on the Fermi surface, so pick a point on the Fermi surface as a function of omega, then the M sigma uh, goes as omega squared uh, as omega goes to zero. Again, at t equals zero. And similar, very gentle dependence on momentum and temperature. So once this is the case, then you can verify uh, that there's a pole on the Fermi surface. So Green's function structure in a complex way. Okay. So it's, uh, here's the complex frequency plane. Um, and so the Green's function has a branch curve at zero frequency. And in fact, the Green's function, uh, the modern Green's function, you can define it, but I really analytic. Uh, in both parts of the plane, the only clarity uh, is on the basis. So there's no real pole in the function uh, above here is what's called the G retired Green's function, and above and here is the G advanced Green's function at the frequency. However, if you pick, uh, and all of this, these, you know, they're not very common. It's by if you get confused. Uh, but you can take the retarded Green's function and analytic past the branch structure. So you go under into the secondary one sheet. 
uh, so this is GR, and take the GR in the lower half plane, where it is not supposed to be used, but, but it, it, it has some structure that can be very useful uh, in determining the Fourier transform of GR as a function of time. Uh, so because of these features, what you find is that there's a pole, uh, there's a pole in the second Riemann sheet, uh, and the pole as a function of momentum uh, does like this. Uh, it comes in quadratically. Um, so, uh, and this, this point here where it hits zero is exactly k equals k. Uh, sorry, maybe I'm wrong, right? I'm writing too small. So, this quadratic behavior here is very much linked to that omega squared behavior there. And what it tells you is that the real part of the pole, which is the energy of the excitation, uh, is much bigger than the imaginary part of the pole, which gives you its lifetime, uh, inverse lifetime. Uh, and therefore, it has a very long lifetime uh, and quasi particles will all define. Okay. So, that's a quick summary uh, of formulated theory. Oh, and one another important property, of course, is the lattice relation. Uh, Let's say that up here. Uh, the volume of the Fermi surface uh, divided by eight pi cubed uh, equals the density of particles per spin. Uh, there could be extra factors of two if you have other or other labels for spinless fermion. That's the basic relation in three density three dimension. Uh, and proving that is a little tricky, uh, but I'm not going to go it. But where you can uh, find some discussion in the notes. Okay. All right. So now we want to take this Fermi surface and uh, destroy the quasi particles. So initially, we're not going to destroy the Fermi surface, as we'll see. Uh, we're going to get a state of matter where this feature, these poles, don't really exist, and uh, uh, this the singularity structure, small frequency, is very different. Uh, this is not true, uh, but this is still true. This is still true. So these are very robust. These will be true. Uh, this will be true, but this will not be true. And, and this will also be true. <laughs> so you're only going to, you know, this is all very robust features, just very hard to get rid of it. Uh, but this you can change. Um, okay. Many people have said, uh, is some, you know, study model uh, is what's called the Ising pneumatic transition. So in this case, uh, you have, say, a square lattice. Uh, and you have you tuning some parameters, say pressure or whatever, such as call it G. And at small g, you have a regular Fermi surface. And so the Fermi surface will uh, not be circular. I mean, it's because you're on a square lattice, that's actually important for the structure of the critical point. So, so I'll just draw kind of a square shape. So that's the Fermi surface for small g, and this is a regular Fermi vector with no broken symmetry. Okay, then there's a point where there's a phase transition at GC. And for some uh, you know, underlying microscopic reason, uh, interactions between the electrons and so on. And this actually does, you know, is observed in many materials, especially the nick type compounds. Uh, the Fermi surface uh, distorts. So the system, instead of having pure square symmetry, uh, distorts to have rectangular symmetry. It just you know, decides to prefer one direction over the other because it ends up lowering the energy of the electrons uh, in space. So, so the Fermi surface then, of course, the volume has to be conserved, uh, so it has some rectangular shape. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Subir. Yeah. Just one thing. Since uh, we are uh, we have uh, experiencing some difficulties in reading, uh, maybe the connection, oh, really? maybe the camera. I don't know if you can uh, solve, but in any case, if you write larger, that would be anyway useful. Maybe okay, it's the maybe connection, or maybe it's the the the. Is the yellow better? 
we are trying to yellow. Well, I, Sorry, I yeah, think, this is the. I think more is matter of the dimension because the, the connection is, is uh, not good and uh, we have difficulties in reading uh, text and formula. Yeah, I think so the Wi-Fi connection is fluctuating very, very much. It's... Or, or maybe the camera, it's not clear. Okay, well, I'm sorry about this. Uh... Yeah, I'm on the Harvard network. Uh, hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know what I can do about that. All right, I will try to write bigger and use. In any case, uh, writing writing larger is anyway good. So maybe during yeah, the, also, the break, uh, if you can change the connection. Some layer from the sunlight. Uh, I'm turning the shades down. Maybe that will help. Is that better a little bit, maybe? <laughs> so someone is saying uh, the quality is uh, like uh, 300, so maybe the, no, that's no. worse. <laughs> of course, yes, yes. I was just trying to change the lighting a little bit. Uh, yeah. yeah, what was someone saying? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, second part of my lecture, actually, I, you know, I may have some slides I could use. Uh, see. So maybe up uh, till the break, we can, uh, let's continue yeah. this way, write larger. If in the, in the break, you can uh, change connection, that would help. Okay, okay, that's a good idea. Or I'll just find some slides and use the slides, <laughs> not the blackboard. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so I will try to write larger. Uh, so let's see. So this is a Fermi liquid. Um, and what I was saying was that because of some broken symmetry, uh, the Fermi surface can become rectangular, but it can become rectangular in two different ways, uh, either this way uh, or the other way. And uh, 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 right, so uh, so then there's a, a phase transition where it goes from square symmetry to a rectangular symmetry, uh, and this is called the pneumatic transition. So this is the pneumatic transition, and we are interested in this particular point. So exactly at this point, there will be a breakdown of these general results, and you'll get a non familiar liquid state. Uh, Okay, so this is one example, and I'll write down some field theory for this, uh, uh, for this example in a minute. Uh, but there are many other problems for which uh, essentially the same field theory applies. In fact, uh, so we're gonna look at a field theory. Can you see what I'm writing now? So it's coupled to a boson, which I'm going to call a phi. Okay, and in this case, phi is just some isomorphic parameter. Uh, so this state would be expectation value of phi say, greater than zero, and the other state would be the expectation value of phi less than zero, and so on. Okay. Uh, so does that look okay now? Am I, is it more legible? Yeah, it should be. <laughs> Hello, are you there? Yeah, yeah, we are listening. Okay. Here. All right, okay. Um, all right, so that's the general problem we look at. So what it applies to one is the Ising pneumatic transition. Uh, there will also variations of this so will apply to ferromagnetic transition, this the basic Curie condition uh, in a metal at zero temperature. You go from a ferromagnetic to a non-ferromagnetic state. Um, and uh, in fact, any broken symmetry, uh, which is at long wavelengths, 
What it doesn't apply to is anti-ferromagnetism, where the broken symmetry is at a finite wavelength. The theory of that is a slightly different. And finally, it applies to the very important problem uh, of the Fermi surface coupled to uh, gauge field. Strangely enough, uh, that problem is not very different. Uh, certainly at the approximation I'm going to use here, it's not different at all uh, to the gauge field. Uh, so this has many, many examples in the literature. I've already mentioned the spin-on Fermi surface uh, last time. Uh, there's also the uh, half-fill nano level where there's a the Halperin D read uh, metallic state in the fractal quantum Hall effect. And finally, there's also the quark. We have quarks interacting with the non debelian gauge field. Uh, that's in three dimensions, so that makes the problem slightly different. I won't. I will only focus on two dimensions here. Uh, but the fact that there's non abelian gauge field as opposed to a abelian gauge field also doesn't seem to matter. So all of these kind of huge class of problems ultimately reduce to uh, Fermi surface coupled to, let me say, uh, a critical boson. Where I did put it here is the word critical, meaning that it's gapless for some reason. Um, for the gauge field, that's automatic. It's just gauge invariance prohibits a mass for the for the dot. Uh, for the isochronic transition and the ferromagnetic transition, you do have to tune a uh, parameter to reach the critical point. Okay, so for all of these various cases, uh, we can try to write down uh, a model for the phase transition um, and then look at some of its properties. So here's going to be our uh, model Lagrangian that we we'll start with. So you have some fermions, but now I won't put any indices on them. We have some energy E of K. Okay, so this is, has to be written in momentum space. Uh, and so in that sense, it's not a field theory. Uh, we'll eventually show you how to write it as a field theory by going to low energies near the momentum uh, for the surface. Uh, hopefully today, <laughs> I will get to that. Uh, and then you have some, some scalar. So let me just write down the simplest action for a scalar. Uh, it will have some time derivative. It can have some spatial derivatives. And it's good to give a little mass and do quite a little, something like this. And this will be our tuning parameter. This will be uh, if you're dealing with a non gauge field, and then you have the tuning parameter uh, that, that's going to destroy the Fermi liquid behavior and, and give us a, a non Fermi liquid state. Okay, uh, now of course you have to couple these two sides together. If you didn't have the fermions, we understand this theory extremely well. That gives you the Wilson Fisher theory uh, of this critical point. In the absence of the Fermi surface, that's what you would get. And in fact, at finite temperature, any finite temperature phase transition, the Fermi surface doesn't matter, and you come back to the usual Wilson Fisher theory. So now you have to couple them together, uh, and I'm going to couple them together with a Yukawa coupling. So it's going to be extremely simple to decide. Uh, times the density uh, C dagger K, CK. Um, there can be some form factor here, which is slightly different for different models. Uh, I'll just ignore it mostly uh, for simplicity. Uh, the, but the one important keep to, uh, point to keep in mind is that the momenta carry, frequent momenta carried by phi are very small. You've taken some long wavelength approximation to this order parameter, as you can for all of these cases. Uh, but the momenta carried by C are not small. They can be large and they're right on the Fermi surface. So the momentum transfer, so just sorry, I shouldn't really write it this way. Uh, really the correct thing to say uh, is something like this, sorry. Uh, and Q is small, but K is not small. Okay. So the momentum transfer will keep you around the Fermi surface, but the Momentum carried by the fermion is still large. And that's, you know, in some sense, why this is not, you know, I can't just, once I write down the theory, I can just open up some book in particle physics and, and look up some Yukawa uh, or Grossman field theory and deduce what I need to know. Uh, because I have this rather strange high momentum degrees of freedom, 
which have high momentum but low energy. Okay, so this is the problem that we'd like to study. Um, and there has been uh, no end of work on it. Uh, and uh, initially, you know, uh, there was a basic result, I think, obtained by uh, Patrick Lee, who first pointed out in two dimensions that, that the self energy has a very singular form that I'm going to derive hopefully today. Uh, and then later on, people tried by various RG methods and large n methods to justify. Uh, that is out of, or make it part of a controlled calculation where you can look at high order corrections and also do uh, transport properties. Uh, and none of that really worked. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, subtleties that appear precisely because of the feature that these, the, the, these electrons have a zero energy excitation on a surface, uh, not at a point. Uh, if you had direct fermions, there'd be no worry at all. You could just solve this. By, uh, by a whole arsenal of methods that are available in, in field theory. Okay, so what I want to present is a proposal uh, relatively recently made uh, where we try to look at this uh, using the techniques that were successful for the SYK model. And in the leading large, if a large n method, and in the leading large n limit, it will give the same answer as previous approaches. But then it clarifies a lot of things and opens up uh, many other calculations you can do carefully, uh, which I hope to get to in the second part of my talk, uh, including the most important calculation we want to figure out is this class of model have in it uh, the most iconic feature of a strange metal, which is this linear key resistivity. Uh, so far, there hasn't been any real uh, success towards that approach, but I we would like to tell you about some recent work where we think we've made some progress. Okay, so the way you do this is you first of all, you put a label alpha, that's called alpha, uh, on the fermions, and alpha will go from one to n. And you also put a label, uh, let me call it gamma, uh, on the scalar field. Uh, and gamma will also go from one to n. Gamma goes from one to n. You can make it different, but let me simplicity make it the same. And so this will be uh, an alpha here, and a beta here, and a gamma here. And in general, you'll have a coupling constant, which is g alpha beta gamma. So now, so now notice I still preserve the translational symmetry of the problem. I'm also preserving the Fermi surface and preserving all the Leitinger effects. Everything is still, uh, you know, it's this is still uh, a more complicated problem with some uh, lots of indices and some very complicated set of coupling constants. Let um, me also remember how I have to scale this thing in the larger limit, and I'm going to put a factor of one over n here. Okay, so uh, this is the problem I'd like to solve. And uh, for some set of coupling G alpha beta gamma, fixed set of couplings. All right, so now I'm going to make a, 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 well, a conjecture, which is supported by you know, some low order calculations, but not proved by any means. The conjecture is that at the critical point, uh, there's a whole domain of these G alpha beta that flow to the same low energy theory. I have the same critical exponents and the same low energy structure uh, in the infinite volume limit. And you know, that's something we saw in the SYK model with the self averaging feature of the self SYK model. You could take any couplings, J I, J, K, L, any fixed set of couplings, you would get the same uh, universal scaling functions for the Bates functions, entropy, and all of that, and the theory of. Uh, time reprimandizations would be the same for any fixed set of couplings. So let's assume that's the case here, that there's some RG flow, and under the RG flow, we uh, here you do have space, you know, and there's no disorder as a function of space so far. And under RG flow, all of these flow to the same fixed point. So if you're only interested in the low energy theory, uh, then why don't we just do the do exactly what we did for the uh, SYK model, uh, we, we average over the alpha beta. Okay. 
okay, with the usual thing, uh, the average of this uh, is zero and the average of the square is some c squared. Okay. Uh, so we're just going to try that and see what happens. Um, and in fact, all the manipulation that I did yesterday uh, on uh, averaging over coupling constant, writing everything as a G sigma theory, all of that goes right through. You can write down a G sigma theory here. Uh, it's a little more complicated because there are two Green's functions. There's a Green's function for C and a Green's function of phi. Uh, and, and there's also momentum we didn't have before. I think the in time before, which we we'll also have here. Momentum is fully conserved. And so this complete translational symmetry, uh, but you get a G sigma theory, uh, which I won't try to write down on the board. It's, uh, it's in the notes. It's just a, a dressed up version with more indices uh, of the G sigma theory for the SYK model, which I wrote last time. Then you can, you know, you can also take the saddle point and you get some equations. And I'll just write down what those equations are. They're also very similar to the SYK equations, uh, except uh, um, except in fact, they turn out to be a very, very familiar set of equations. Large n saddle point equations. All right. Um, so they turn out to be the following. So, of course, the Green's function of the electrons uh, has exactly the form I wrote on before. And the Green's function of the boson, which I'm going to call D, D uh, of K and omega, uh, will be omega squared, A squared plus uh, minus the sum of self energy, pi of K and omega. Um, and what are sigma and phi? Well, I can write them down diagrammatically. Sigma uh, for the uh, electrons is. This is a fully renormalized Green's function G, uh, and this is fully renormalized Green's function D, and there's a factor of G squared here, D and G. And the polarization operator of the boson uh, is just uh, arrow here with full G's over here and here. So these type of equations have appeared, you know, for 50 years in condensed matter. Um, they in the context of superconductivity, they call the Elyashberg equations in the context of uh, magnetism. I don't know, maybe the Mittal Elyashberg equations and somebody else's people names attached to it. It's very, very simple looking equations uh, where you just take a simple one loop expression for the boson and uh, fermion self energies. But at the same time, you put fully renormalized uh, Green's functions and uh, uh, in, inside the self energies. So people have certainly thought of doing this, but the curious fact is that so far, there hasn't been any systematic method that in which they can be justified, uh, controlled in some expansion with some small parameter. And, and now we're seeing why, well, because really to justify that, you do need to average. You need to average over a set of random couplings. Uh, and then on, and only then will you get some kind of one over n expansion. Now, of course, you know, in the, in the weak coupling, the measure of G is small, and there are some more, some justifications that are valid uh, in the theory of superconductivity. But we're not, we don't want to make G small. We're interested in the case where G is large. The coupling can't be weak. You have to have some other systematic justification for truncating at this order. And it's really the SYK uh, idea of averaging over couplings that gives you 
some justification for these equations. Okay, so now that we have these equations, uh, we have to solve them. And these are much more complicated than the SYK equations. They're nonlinear integral differential equations again, but now they involve not just time, they involve both space and time. The, the um, you know, the Green's functions depend, I mean, the self energies depend on trivially and on both omega and k. Okay. <clears throat> All right, but now the remarkable fact is that in the low energy limit, just like in the SYK model, <clears throat> uh, these equations actually have an exact solution, uh, essentially exact apart from some uh, renormalizations of affected masses uh, in the real part of self energy that require you know, post numerical solution of these equations. Uh, but these can be solved essentially exactly. And I don't know how much time I have to show you all the steps of that solution. Uh, <clears throat> I'll show you a few steps. So, but, it, but the way it proceeds is actually quite straightforward. First, you just replace these Green's functions uh, in here by the bare Green's function, and you just compute the self energies. And these calculations have been in the literature for years. Uh, and, and then you find certain features. And then you find that uh, when you put fully renormalized means function, the singular part, the low energy part, doesn't get changed at all. It has exactly the same uh, form. Okay, so, so in the end, you can get the answer quite easily by just doing perturbation theory, uh, but then justify that it actually holds to all orders and these and as a full self consistent solution of these equations uh, is a bit more complicated. I probably won't have time to go to that, but it's it's actually spelled out in some detail in the notes. Okay. All right, so let's begin by just doing the perturbative calculation. So first let me begin by just evaluating this graph, where I just use bare Green's functions here. Uh, so this is, you know, first thing you learn in solid state physics is that the Linhardt polarizability, uh, so pi, uh, let me call it Q and omega, uh, capital omega in the notes. Yeah. <clears throat> so minus, minus G squared, sum on uh, omega, integral K. <clears throat> <coughs> Imaginary frequency, sorry, epsilon k plus q. That's one Green's function. And then I have I omega epsilon k, and the other Green's function. All right, you can now do the sum over frequency, uh, and then you get uh, the famous Lindhard result, integral over k. Uh, Fermi function epsilon of k plus q uh, minus the Fermi function of epsilon k divided by i omega plus epsilon k minus epsilon of k plus q. Okay. Subir. Yes. Sorry, since uh, now the quality dropped uh, again. Uh, May I suggest oh, that uh, now, where you prefer, we do a break and uh, then we decide how to continue? Because now it's it's very difficult to to read. So, what uh, is it? Just the the, the Wi-Fi connection or the writing on the board or what is it? What is the main problem? Uh, it's the Wi-Fi connection for sure. The writing on the board is fine when it's okay. When it's when is. the Wi-Fi connection is fine, we can still read some parts of it, but it's too pixelated usually to read anything. So it's not the writing. So it's the Wi-Fi connection. I see. Yeah. Okay. Hey, All right. I, All right. Let's take a break. Let me try to fix. Let's the take problem. a break and uh, and uh, let's see if we if you can figure out. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will. Uh... Sorry to interrupt at this point, but maybe please decide if you want to go a little yeah, bit. I, I, uh, yeah. I I think I have some uh, some 
uh, slides. I may just have to use slides. Uh, that may be because I don't see a wired connection in this room. And the Wi Fi is the Wi Fi. I'm using the Harvard Wi Fi. Yes, at a certain Maybe point. Okay, so, so sorry for those difficulties. Uh, I, you know, I learned that there's a big general problem with Wi-Fi at Harvard. Uh, everyone's using it these days. So, okay. Uh, all right, so these are the <coughs> saddle point equations um, of this theory here, where we had fermions coupled to a scalar field uh, with the Zukava coupling, which was a random three index tensor. Uh, and once you average over the Zukava couplings, you get a G sigma theory, uh, which then saddle point equations are sort of like the SYK equations. SYK equation of sigma was G cubed. Here it's sigma G times T and pi is GT. And this is the equation written out in explicit form. So what we are doing, and here's the G sigma theory, if you want to see it, it's not particularly enlightening, but there it is. <laughs> okay. So I was just trying to evaluate this Lindard susceptibility. This is just the evaluation uh, you know, of, of this graph with bare fermion propagators. Uh, and this is the famous uh, Lindhart result. Okay. So of course, uh, you know, we can open up any textbook and evaluate it, but I want to now evaluate it to, to highlight a very important feature. Uh, and the feature I want to see is, appears most naturally when I take the low frequency limit of the imaginary part. It's the, always the dissipative imaginary part that we're interested in. So we take the imaginary part of this for real frequencies now. Uh, so this Fermi function uh, comes in just as before. And the denominator after you analytically continue gives you another delta function. Okay. Um, so, so now let's see. So the, the Fermi function, um, okay, what have I done here? <laughs> uh, so the Fermi function, uh, F of E K, uh, let's see, uh, what have I done here? Um, so, so this thing um, you can write as, uh, you know, delta, um, de oops, sorry. Uh, Yeah, so this, this expression here, uh, you can write as df de times uh, ek plus q minus ek. Okay, now ek plus q minus ek from the second expression is just omega. So you pull out the factor of omega right here. Uh, and the df over de at zero temperature, just a delta function. So that's this delta function over here. Okay, so that's still essentially an exact manipulation as temperature goes to zero. So you have two delta functions that you have to uh, um, evaluate here. And there's a two dimensional integral. And so that means that you're only going to get a point uh, in somewhere in K space that's going to contribute some finite answer. All right, so now let's just imagine we take also Q going to be very small. Uh, then we can expand this in powers of Q. Uh, and we already have an omega dependence here. So we just put omega equals zero. You can do better if you want. Uh, but when the dust settles then, the solution of this equation gives you ek equals zero. And the solution of this equation gives you q dot d, the del k ek equals zero. So which is the point of the Fermi surface that's going to solve those two equations? So q remember is the momentum carried by the boson. So here's a picture that shows you how this works. So here's the direction of Q. Uh, and this is the Fermi surface. So that's the solution of the first of the equations. So, so the solution of this equation uh, here is just the Fermi surface. And the solution of the next equation uh, tells you that Q uh, must be orthogonal to the gradient of the Fermi surface. And the, so this is just the normal to the Fermi surface. So that means which are the points in which Q is orthogonal to the normal of the Fermi surface. But there are two such points where that happens, this point over here and this point over here. So for a given direction of Q, the entire contribution of the imaginary part of the polarizability uh, comes from these two points. 
uh, and nowhere else. It doesn't depend on the rest of the Fermi surface at all. Uh, so you can just go to point K naught and minus K naught and evaluate them. Uh, I assume there's invergent symmetry, so you get the same contribution. Uh, so you just evaluate it. And now to evaluate these delta functions, um, you have to look at the, at the dispersion relation epsilon of K in the vicinity of these points, in the vicinity of K naught. So near K naught, first of all, you know, let's choose a convenient axis. So we'll choose the axis so that Q points in the Y direction. And then uh, this is the X direction. And so with these coordinates along this direction, uh, the fermion dispersion is linear. So there's a linear function here. So it's, uh, you know, just like a, it's like a 1D fermion gas. So now if I only took this dispersion into account, this will look like a one-dimensional Fermi gas and the Fermi surface looks like a, a series of one-dimensional Fermi gases pointing in different directions. And in fact, there have been many papers in the literature by very famous people uh, trying to understand uh, aspects of this uh, Fermi surface coupled to massless boson problem uh, using a collection of one-dimensional fermion gases. Um, I, I strongly believe this is very misguided uh, and the reason it's misguided um, is that, in fact, the, whereas the energy goes linearly with momentum in this direction, in the other direction, it goes quadratically uh, because it's tangent to the Fermi surface. Uh, and therefore, uh, you also have to keep the curvature of the Fermi surface with this kappa in there. Uh, and, you know, another way to say it is that if you're going to have scattering with very low energies. The best way to scatter fermions with very low energy is to scatter them tangent to the Fermi surface, not normal to the Fermi surface. So the most singular, most important scattering events of the fermions all happen tangent to the Fermi surface. So you do have to worry about the curvature of the Fermi surface uh, for that reason. Okay, and in the other direction, there's another chiral fermion which has the opposite uh, dispersion, but the same dispersion as a function of Ky. Uh, okay, so now you take this, these two dispersions and you plug them in here, uh, and now you can just do the integral, it's not very hard, uh, and you get an answer, uh, and there's the answer. So, so the imaginary part of pi and q and omega uh, has a very singular form. Uh, this is actually true in any dimension, um, although getting the coefficient is very easy just in two dimensions. Uh, and so what you, what you then have is this is the famous result that m pi uh, goes as uh, omega over q. So this is uh, the key ingredient in Landau damping of bosonic fluctuations about the Fermi surface. Uh, and it comes from the polarizability of the, of the fermion. So it's even, you know, this is just free fermion. So this is also present in the Fermi liquid and has this very strange non-relativistic structure uh, omega over Q. And, and what this particular analysis shows you that the standard dapic is entirely dominated by momenta QY, which are tangent to the Fermi surface. Uh, so if you want to take into account, you can't just work with a 1D Fermi gas. A 1D Fermi gas does not have Landau dapic. Uh, okay, so but the 2D and higher does. Now, if you try to do this in three dimensions, what would happen uh, is that the, the momenta tangent to the Fermi surface don't, are not just two points, uh, but that's a, there's a whole line. There'll be a whole line on the three-dimensional Fermi surface, uh, which will be tangent, where the uh, tangent to the Fermi surface will be pointing along Q. Uh, and so you have to integrate over that whole line. And so that makes the, the theory of a three-dimensional Fermi surface a little bit different. Uh, in fact, it's in the end weakly coupled and can be understood in perturbation theory. Uh, but the 2D, um, these points turn out to be very strongly coupled to the boson with momenta along this direction. Okay, so that's the first result. So what we have done in this solution of these saddle point equations uh, is just evaluated uh, pi um, in the low frequency limit using bare Green's function. Okay. Uh, so now the next step is, um, is this 
how general is this as well? Why, why can I get away with using just the, the free fermion Green's function, or can I? All right, so it turns out, as we will see in a minute, of course, there are self-energy corrections to the fermions, uh, but the self-energy corrections uh, have this form, that there's some smooth dependence on K we don't care much about, that's just to normalize the dispersion. But the frequency, the singular frequency dependent doesn't depend on momentum, at least we'll see that in a minute. Uh, and therefore, uh, let's imagine there's some sigma of omega and try to redo this calculation. There's some sigma of omega, and you put it back into this original expression. You put it back into this expression right here. Uh, you know, you add uh, a sigma of omega over here, minus sigma, and a minus sigma over there. Okay. Now it's a very complicated integral. Uh, in general, you think you can't do it because you don't know the frequency dependence of sigma. Uh, but there's some magic that happens here. Uh, basically, uh, the sigma of omega um, just essentially drops out of the result. It doesn't, doesn't affect the answer. And uh, one way you can kind of see this already here uh, is imagine you take this expression. Now I'm, I'm putting in this linearized dispersion. It is important to put in that dispersion for this result to be correct. But it's only true for the low frequency singular part, uh, which is all we care about. So we put in this dispersion and you have this linear dependence on K here and you have a linear dependence on K here. Okay, so now you can do the integral over K because it's very simple over Kx, sorry. Uh, and then you find it only depends upon, you know, which side uh, of the pole uh, is as a function of Kx. And that depends on the sign of Sigma, not the value of Sigma. So when you do this integral over Kx, it just gives you this answer. It doesn't care about what the self energy is, it just depends on the sign of the frequencies, basically. <laughs> uh, just tells you which, whether you're looking at a particle, you know, whether it pulls the upper half plane or the lower half plane. And similarly for the singular part, when you do the integral over Ky, again, the same thing is true. And so those sigma just drops out. And when the dust settles, you get exactly the same answer that I got by doing the um, perturbative calculation. So that this Landau damping answer is actually exact, uh, modulo the fact that the self-energy uh, could renormalize the curvature and the Fermi velocity. But I just assume that's already been taken into account because in the end, these are quantity that you measure uh, in an experiment from the shape of the Fermi surface. Okay. So, so that's, that's encouraging. And all this requires is that the self-energy, singular part of self-energy have the momentum independent. All right, so now let's proceed and compute uh, the self-energy of the electrons. So now in the boson, I'm going to pull, it is important that I put in the fully renormalized uh, uh, boson propagator with this omega over Q, which we have now argued is actually quite robust. And for the fermions, I put in the full, full uh, self-energy in here too. And then I go ahead and evaluate the momentum integrals in exactly the same way. And lo and behold, again, for the same reason, sigma just drops out. And <coughs> the final answer is this integral, uh, which you can then evaluate. Uh, it's highly singular. Uh, and this is the most important result in the end of this discussion you get sigma of omega is constant times omega to the two thirds. So this is to be compared in a Fermi liquid. Uh, in a Fermi liquid, we had uh, G of omega, oh, sorry, sigma of omega went as omega squared, the imaginary part of sigma. So it doesn't go as omega squared, it's much larger. In fact, uh, and this is another interesting similarity to the SYK model. And also let me remind you in the SYK model, uh, this went as square root of omega. So it's not as singular as the SYK model, but it's almost as singular, omega to the two thirds, <coughs> but it's much more singular than a Fermi liquid. So, so when the dust settles, you get a Green's function, uh, which has this dispersion, which we didn't have in the SYK model. 
you have a self energy, which is just like in the SYK model. And there was also a term here, I omega, the bare term, but we can just throw it out just like in the SYK model, it doesn't matter uh, because it's much smaller than this term here as low frequency. All right, so there's our uh, claimed structure of a non-Fermi liquid. It's really the best established non-Fermi liquid in two spatial dimensions. Um, and uh, here's the imaginary part of GFK and omega. So what you notice is that right at the Fermi surface, exactly at Kx equals zero, uh, there is a divergence, uh, and, but it's some power law singularity, omega to the minus two, one over two thirds. Uh, but when you move away from the Fermi surface, in fact, this thing goes to zero uh, and it's some very broad peak. Um, there's no real pole of this thing uh, in the second half plane, it's just a branch cut. And uh, there's no quasi particle picture, but the position of the Fermi surface is very precise. It's exactly determined. There is a Fermi surface. The Fermi surface hasn't gone away, but you've lost the quasi particle. So this is the basic state of matter that uh, is a starting point for understanding certainly the half field Landau level, uh, the spin on Fermi surface, uh, there's a lot of papers uh, building off on this and looking at its consequences. And we hope also the strange metal in the cuprates, uh, but then you run into some difficulty because this problem by itself doesn't have any resistance. Uh, uh, as uh, well, I'll discuss in a few minutes. So, okay, so what time is it now? Okay, I have, so, okay, I'm doing fine. I guess I move a bit faster when I'm using my iPad because I don't have to write. Anyway, so this is a good point uh, to ask for questions. I mean, all I've shown you so far um, is that you take this random Yukawa coupling model, take the large end limit, and then after some, uh, some fancy uh, analyses, uh, we can get the exact low energy solutions, uh, modulo renormalization of the shape of the Fermi surface um, of seven of these equations. And they give you this non-Fermi liquid solution with this omega to the two thirds singularity in the self energy. Any questions? Okay, so, so I, just, I, I don't know, there's a lot of different things I could do in the next uh, half an hour or so that I have left. Uh, let me say, dwell a little more on this. You know, in particular, this, you know, right now I've just pulled the omega to the two thirds out of a hat. I just told you, oh, you evaluate these graphs and after a lot of analysis, you get omega to the two thirds. Uh, we'd like to do a bit better. Is there some way I could have seen that right away? Uh, just by looking at the field theory. Why is it omega to the two thirds? Uh, in fact, you can, and, and let me show you how that calculation goes. Okay, so the key to this um, is what uh, we call the patch field theory. So what we saw, at least in two dimensions, was for a given direction QI, for a given direction of the boson fluctuations, this is the key figure here, uh, the only important fermion degrees of freedom uh, were at these points k naught and minus k naught. So these points, of course, have some big momentum. But now we have an opening. We want to write a field theory. So we have an opening to write a field theory. We just take small momenta in the vicinity of this point. So we assume the fermion momenta are small when measured from k naught or minus k naught. So this means that instead of having the original electron C, um, I have this continuum for me on psi plus and psi minus. And with this new fermions, I can do a gradient expansion. And now I have an honest to God field theory. Okay, so this is the field, what the field theory looks like. Uh, right here. So I have the two fermions one with, so call them psi plus and psi minus. So the alpha, beta, gamma indices are just like before. Uh, and this fermion has a linear dispersion in the x direction uh, and a quadratic dispersion in the y direction. 
and the other fermion is the same, except the sign of the linear dispersion is opposite. So one is left moving, the other is right moving, but they also disperse in the y direction. Okay, and then I have a boson. Uh, for the boson, uh, so notice I did this for the boson moving in the, uh, was momentum was primarily in the y direction, so I only include the y direction. Uh, and then there's a Yukawa coupling. Uh, phi, this is now just, you know, integral over all space of, of this. Uh, you could also add in if you wanted, uh, which I haven't written out explicitly, uh, d by theta of phi squared plus one half uh, d by d tau, d by dx phi squared. But there's no symmetry between x and y because already the fermions have a different dispersion along the x and y directions. Okay, so now let's try to uh, do some scaling analysis of this theory. So we'll rescale as usual uh, x by a factor of b. Now we want to preserve this uh, kind of dispersion. Uh, and in fact, you can show it's preserved to all orders by sort of, because there's a kind of a rotated Galilean symmetry. If you think of x as time and y as space, then this has the, exactly the same symmetry as Galilean invariance. And, and this theory has that invariance. It's, it's kind of a sliding symmetry of the Fermi surface. Uh, so, so you have to scale y with uh, one half. Now you'd be tempted to also scale time with power one because time is like space. And so if you want to preserve this, but that would be not what you want to do. Uh, because we know in the end, this term didn't matter. This disappeared from the problem in the Green's function. So for now, we're going to imagine we're going to rescale thing where this thing actually going to scale to zero. So that means you pick a factor of Z and as long as Z is bigger than one, then this term will be just irrelevant. It will scale away at long distances. So we just leave Z arbitrary for now. Okay, so now we have to uh, look at, say, the scaling of phi and psi. How does phi and psi scale? Uh, so we can do psi easily by just demanding that this Lagrangian, this free term be invariant. Uh, and so you will get uh, psi goes this way. Um, and also you scale phi by demanding this term be invariant because this is the term that's most important. It's the wide momentum is mostly in the y direction. So that will give you exact, in fact, gives you the same scaling dimension for phi and psi. And now again, without too much work, you can see that as long as z is bigger than one, uh, this term doesn't matter. And this term also doesn't matter. And this term, doesn't, all of these terms just scale away. Okay, so we can just remove these terms. We can remove that one. We can remove that one. Can remove that one. So what you're left with is now the nonlinear coupling. So you want that, and now the idea is the theory has used some fixed point value, uh, where the value of g doesn't matter in the end, uh, and so you want to get rid of, uh, you know, so you want to imagine g is fixed. So this thing should be dimensionless, uh, and that'll be your fixed point theory. So you work out the scaling of G uh, with just these, you know, this is really very elementary analysis once you know where to go. Uh, and then you find this is how G scales. And there you go. Now you see where the three half came from. Uh, G is invariant at a fixed point value if and only if Z is three halves in this very simple tree level analysis. So that's the answer, Z is three halves. Uh, at least in this larger limit, that's what you find. And also from this kind of tree level analysis. Now there may be corrections to Z at higher orders. Uh, we don't know, it's kind of hard to work it out. It hasn't really been worked out because it's really, uh, you know, the calculation that needs to be done is similar to the short chain fluctuation calculations that's been done for the SYK model, uh, but it's a much harder calculation here because you have both space and time to worry about and you don't have Lorentz invariance. So uh, maybe someday, some aspects of it have been done by Max Metlitsky using a slightly different method. Uh, and those show that Z doesn't have any denormalizations and Psi has a very small anomalous exponent, which is different from this. And Phi has, Phi in fact, you can show that this is exact. That this follows from the exactness of uh, Landau damping. Uh, okay. 
So, so that's another way of seeing it. Uh, this famous result of z equals three halves, which gives you this omega to the two thirds self energy. All right. Any questions? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, I'm going to now uh, switch to a PowerPoint presentation and talk about some very recent work. So this is the only part of all the my four lectures, five lectures, which is uh, on you know essentially ongoing work, which I'm I want to tell you about just in the very end of my lectures. Uh, and these concern uh, the problem of uh, uh, transport in this theory, <laughs> which turns out to be remarkably complicated. Uh, but we think we're in the end, once you think about it the right way, we think it, uh, there's a lot of simplification that I want to tell you about a little bit. Okay. Um, so, how should I do that? So, I have to stop sharing here. And I hope I can share. Yes, I can share. Good. Okay. Just give me a minute, sorry. Okay. Um, here we go. Um, all right, now I have to. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you can see my big screen with a slide, I hope. Yes. Yes. Yes, we see. Oh, no arrows. Sorry. Uh, somebody remember how to change this? Uh, no. no. Gotten this. <laughs> um, customized presenter delay. No. Uh, how do I get the mouse? Somebody remember this? Oh, I have to go to preferences, I think. Yeah. Slideshow. Yeah, there's, you can see my arrow then. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes, we see. Okay. All right. So this is the theory I've been telling you about. I'm just going to focus here on the Yukawa coupling. So this is a uh, fermions coupled to this boson. Um, okay. Uh, actually, before I stop about this, uh, no, no. Yeah, let me continue. I, I'll come, I have one more thing to say, which I'll go back to the iPad. All right. So here's the uh, fermions coupled to this scalar. Um, and uh, these are some random set of couplings, but they're independent of space. So people have, okay, we've computed this very singular self energy, omega to the two thirds. So now you can try to put this in a calculation of a transport property, but transport is a little different game from computing the self energy. Uh, and the basic difference is the following. I mean, so the self energy you can view as the scattering rate of the electron, well, which carries some charge. But uh, in transport, we are not interested in certain scattering processes. So if a, electron is scattered in the forward direction, that doesn't change the current. Although it will change uh, the self-energy, the self-energy doesn't care 
um, by how what angle you get scattered. It just cares that you get scattered. But when you're doing transport, there's this famous one minus cos theta factor, which weights with theta as the scattering angle, uh, which tells you that forward scattering doesn't contribute as much as backward scattering. So one minus cos theta is zero in the forward direction and two in the backward direction. So backward scattering is much more important or even sideways scattering, but forward scattering is not important at all. So that's a very basic feature difference between the self energy and the transport. Uh, now, sometimes people said, yeah, but we don't worry about this. Uh, we just go ahead and do a perturbative calculation. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I said, yeah, you have to worry about this, but there's another uh, quantity you have to worry about. So you have to put this one minus cos theta factor, uh, and that's what people have done, famous people, and you again compute the resistivity, and in this theory, you get a t to the fourth third resistivity. If you just take the scattering rate and just put an extra factor of one minus cosine theta, instead of being omega to the two thirds, it gives you some t to the fourth third resistivity. Okay, but that result is also wrong. <laughs> and, and this has to do with another effect, which is sometimes called the drag effect. So, the, so let's think about phonons. So when phonons, when electrons are coupled to phonons, what happens is that you, uh, the electrons can you know, scatter off a phonon and that gives you some uh, resistance. Uh, but then the phonons uh, can come back, the phonons carry away some of the momentum of the electrons, but the phonons can then come back and give the momentum back to the electrons. So if, so eventually, if you wait long enough or look at low enough frequencies, the electron phonon scattering, as long as it's very long wavelength scattering and doesn't involve what's called umklap, actually compute, contributes essentially no resistance. Uh, this is called phonon drag. And uh, in fact, this was pointed out by Pyrrhus in a famous paper in 1930s, uh, where Bloch had done the calculation without the drag before and you know, derived what we call Bloch's law for electron phonon scattering. And then Pyrrhus pointed out, well, actually Bloch is wrong. Uh, but in experiment, it turned out Bloch was correct. And partly for that reason, I mean, it worked. Bl Bloch's calculation worked. Uh, and Piles seemed to have pointed out some very subtle feature which had nothing to do with the real world. Uh, and so people kind of forgot about, I would say, Piles' uh, observation. Uh, and why was Piles, you know, not, Piles' calculation is completely correct, I should say. But why didn't it work in the real world? Well, in the real world, they have two features. One is that the electrons are rather weakly coupled to the phonons. And second is no crystal is perfect. Every crystal has boundaries, defects. So it's true that the electron will scatter off a phonon and give some of the momentum to the phonon. Uh, but the phonon, before it can give its momentum back to the electrons, will find some impurity and dump it there. And, just, and so it'll just disappear. So we can, so once an electron is scattered off a phonon, we can just forget about that phonon, which is what Bloch did, okay. And that works. It's only in recent years, especially in some very beautiful work of Andy McKinsey's group, people have managed to make crystals clean enough, you know, with essentially zero impurities, where they're starting to see these phonon drag effects. Uh, and so that's a whole another field of people exploring. But here in this problem, of a non-Fermi liquid, uh, my claim is that <coughs> Parallels is completely correct. And in fact, always correct. And the reason is this coupling G is extremely strong. It's so strong that the electron even ceases to exist. All you have is some quantum critical soup and the electrons do not even have an identity independent of the phonons. They're all the same collective quantum critical objects. So it doesn't even make sense to say, well, here the electron is carrying the momentum and there the phonons carrying momentum. The whole field is carrying the momentum and there's a stress energy tensor that's conserved in this theory. Uh, and so because of that fact, Piles is really always correct because this is a strongly coupled field theory. Uh, and therefore, when you compute the conductivity in this theory, it's actually infinite. There is a delta function at zero frequency, despite the fact that the self energy is so large of the electron. 
there is at zero temperature no resistance in this theory. Uh, a simple fact that seems to have just been overlooked for many years in the literature on non fermi liquids. Uh, but there is some finite frequency part where, where you get the same omega to the two thirds appearing and that that's certainly fine. Uh, but this part, you know, so claiming that this non fermi liquid is going to explain uh, the strange metal behavior uh, is just, just simply not uh, in my view, tenable. Okay. So you have to do you have to do something. You have to add something to this. You know this beautiful theory, and it seems very promising, uh, but it doesn't seem to explain the one property that's always measured, which is the linear T resistivity. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, all right. So we said. Uh, uh, this is, I should say, work with um, uh, Avishkar Patel, who's a postdoc at Berkeley. Uh, Ilya Estelitz is currently a postdoc uh, at Harvard. And uh, Ha Yu Gu is a student at Harvard uh, working in my group. Okay, so we're going to add some random potential. Okay, but now the key thing about this potential, it's a function, random function of position. So we've got to break translation variant, there's some impurities. Uh, and the impurities will give you uh, some average, uh, you know, V squared here, and your average over VIG. So the so your average this average doesn't you know, average over G doesn't give you any trans uh, conductivity resistivity, but this will certainly. Uh, and this is you know this kind of impurity potential is really uh, the main ingredient in this very successful and beautiful theory of a disordered Fermi liquid. Uh, from this you get you know diffusons, cooperons, and all kinds of weak localization effects and everything, which has been thoroughly studied. So let's put in this, this term here and see what it does to this critical Fermi surface. Uh, break you know, every, you know, any sample anybody looks at certainly has some impurities. Well, what you find uh, is, you know, a bit disappointing, uh, but not, you know, but uh, encouraging. Uh, so the boson self energy, remember I told you it was mod omega over Q, uh, but now it just becomes mod omega. It's cut off by this uh, potential rather than Q, which is also makes sense. And so the boson propagator, instead of having a mod omega over Q, just becomes mod omega. And you then redo the calculation I just told you in the presence of this new boson propagator. Then you get, this is just the elastic scattering from the impurities this IV squared term. Uh, and instead of getting omega to the two thirds, you get omega log omega. That's still not a Fermi liquid, but it's, you know, it's, it's what people call a marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, so that's all very exciting that it's giving you a marginal Fermi liquid. And there are you know, some measurements that seem to suggest there's a marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, but unfortunately, you do not get any singular time dependence in the in the transport. Again, here you find that the resistance is just some uh, in constant. It's it's not the resistance is not zero, but it's a constant. It's not really any interesting function of temperature. Uh, and the reason is very much in this case is that this is mostly forward scattering, so momentum is you know only weakly violated by these very long wavelength fluctuations, and they just don't have enough. Uh, you know, enough traction to, to give you any interesting resist behavior to resistance. Uh, so this will be described in a paper we hope to put on the archive soon. Uh, there's a very careful calculation being done by uh, how you go to show this. Okay, so basically you just get the usual Fermi liquid-like behavior. Uh, in fact, so this is, this in that sense, this is pointing, you, You've got a non Fermi liquid here with this term, then you put in a few impurities and at low enough temperature that it just becomes a Fermi liquid. It just it makes it much less singular. I should also add, you know, adding all these different terms is no more complicated. Now we know how to deal with this because it's just average, you know, you can take the large and limit in exactly the same way, just have a few more extra terms in the G sigma theory. So what do we do? So this is what we're gonna describe in our recent paper. Uh, you put in a random interaction. The key is putting in not just random potential scattering, but random interactions. 
So how does this G prime differ from the G? It's just that it depends on R. Let's say it's a random function, not just in flavor space, but in position space. And again, there's no reason we shouldn't have such a random function. It'll be generated by the V. Uh, but if you want to put it in the large N theory, you've got to put it in by hand to begin with. Uh, and again, you can now go ahead and take the large N limit with this additional term. So this is now you know, even more like the SYK term, but in uh, here you have position and it's a random function of position two. But you have, so you have all three terms. In fact, this is probably the biggest term, which is what's driving the, the non fermi liquid physics. We have some relative, you know, weaker impurity terms. And you need these to, to break the fact uh, that the analog of phonon drag will give you zero resistance. All right, so you can again take the large and limit and solve the equation. I mean, it's the same procedure that I've been describing so far in the last two lectures. You just, once you write down the model, you take the large and limit, you average, you get some saddle point equation, you solve them. Uh, actually, you do a bit more here, then you also compute the, the resistivity. That's a more complicated, that involves summing a set of ladder diagrams, and it's very similar to the type of calculation done for the SYK model to compute the scaling dimensions of operators and, and so on by Maldesen and Stanford. So you just apply the same set of tools, but to this more complicated problem with more indices and more spatial coordinates. Okay, so what you find then, again, you get this diffusive form for the boson propagator with Z equals two, uh, but, and, and you get uh, fermion self energy, which is omega log omega, but lo and behold, uh, this term does give you what's observed. The random Yukawa coupling uh, gives you, in fact, a linear resistivity quite robustly. So that's, you know, it's, that's my best understanding of where what the strange metal behavior is due to. Uh, it's really due to uh, a weak uh, random, random component of the interaction between the fermions and the bosons. That's what drives it. Uh, and very generically for this wide class of problems that I've been talking about, you'll just get exactly a linear T uh, behavior. Okay, so that, you know, obviously no details there, but just, I mean, I, I'll, uh, what I'll just say is that it's the same set of G sigma equations with just more indices and more, more things that you have to then solve in various limits. Uh, and, uh, but that is no more, not more complicated than that. Okay. We'd of course love to know one of our end corrections. Um, that's really a tall order. Uh, I think, you, you know, there's some reason for believing this, that this is, exponent is not going to change, but we haven't by any means proven that, uh, but okay. All right, so I think uh, that's what I'll, uh, that's all I have to say with these slides. Uh, any questions? Sir, you mentioned a uh... The ladder diagram calculation is SYK, but uh, there I think they used a lot of uh, relied on the, the, the conformal symmetry. But uh, yes. when, but once, in, we, once you have a spatial dimensions, you, you do not, uh, I think, have that uh, Right, dimension. yeah, no, that's right. So it's harder. <laughs> in some way, it's harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, we're only looking for the low frequency behavior of a, of a certain property, the, the transport. Uh, and uh, yeah, you have to try a, a different set of tricks. Uh, and uh, you know, that's what we'll describe in a forthcoming paper. Yeah, but it can be done. It's not so bad. In fact, it's a, it looks harder, but in the end it's easier uh, because you don't have, first of all, you don't have this, uh, there's no time reprimization zero mode. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, it's just this one diffusive mode that you have to keep track of, yeah. There also don't seem to be any set of higher infinite set of conformal operators, anything like that. Um, there are in the pairing channel that you can get some non-trivial operator scaling dimensions. I haven't talked about that, but in this transport channel, there's really, it, it, it's relatively straightforward in the end, but it's the same set of graphs uh, that you would get the analog of the graphs you would get in the computation of the uh, four point correlation function of the SYK model, yeah.
Um, okay, now I, I, want to, I want to say one more thing and then I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and apologies for all these uh, confusions. Uh, yeah, I'm still connected. So I'm going to go back to my iPad. Yeah, yeah. So I want to go to this very important problem uh, of a Fermi surface coupled to gauge field. I asserted at the beginning of my lecture that this is also described by the same basic theory. So now I want to argue why that's the case. It seems rather mysterious when you first encounter it, uh, but uh, yeah, it's essentially the same theory. And um, yeah, I guess my Max Miklitsky played, a, I think. A, important role in highlighting this. Okay, so we start with this problem here. You have some Fermi surface, uh, and uh, I'm just writing down for simplicity, uh, just a U1 gauge field, and, I, and even only the spatial component of a U1 gauge field. So then, you know, the K goes to K minus A, and this is the Maxwell term that you could have from some uh, high energy uh, polarizabilities. So this is the kind of theory you would start to with it. Well, there's also a Chen Simons term for the new equals one half theory, but in the end, it doesn't change the final conclusions. So certainly this is the, the theory you would start with for a spin-on Fermi surface. So let's imagine we have a spin-on that I talked about two lectures ago, which forms a Fermi surface, uh, and then you have to couple it to U1 gauge field. Okay, first of all, why can I, why, why do I just leave out the time component? Well, the time component of the gauge field couples the density of fermions. Uh, and the density fluctuations we know in any Fermi gas are screened, uh, screened by the polarizability, finite compressibility uh, of, the, uh, of the Fermi gas. So, so they're screened and they, they don't do anything. So we just have to focus on the transverse component and it's easy to separate the transfer and longitudinal component by taking this, uh, this gauge, the Coulomb gauge. So we work in the Coulomb gauge. All right, so now, uh, so you have some long wave fluctuations and we're going to work in the Coulomb gauge. So let's go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, do exactly the same calculation we did for a scalar field, but for this vector field. Uh, and for exactly the same reasons, when we compute the polarizability of this vector field, we will find that we're dominated by these two antipodal points. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. So the vector field, the vector potential will act here and here, and will have momentum in this direction. So however, we have the Landau uh, gauge, the Coulomb gauge condition, the del dot A is zero. So if the momentum is in this direction, then the vector potential must be in this direction. So I only need to keep track of the X component of the vector potential in this gauge. Okay, so, so that's even simpler then. And in fact, this X component of the vector potential uh, is exactly the scalar field phi. So there's phi, oops, sorry. Uh, there's phi right there as the, excuse me, it's the y component. What did I do? Uh, yeah, it's the phi, uh, let's see, what am I doing here? Del dot A is zero. Uh, yeah, okay, this is a typo. This should be x, sorry. Yeah, it is the x component, not the y component. Uh, because Q is pointing in the Y direction. So A should point in the X direction. So this is, this should be, uh, uh, should be phi zero. All right, so how does the X component uh, couple? Well, the X component, recall that the X derivative um, is linear. The X dispersion is just linear. So this just means this, uh, you know, you get D by DX uh, minus I AX. So that's just phi. And so you get this Yukawa coupling. So you're back to the same type of coupling. <laughs> There's only one difference uh, between the vector potential case 
uh, and the scalar potential case uh, and the uh, uh, scalar order parameter. And that's this sign. This is the most important difference. And this does make a difference to some things, but not to anything we've discussed so far. This sign is a minus sign. So remember for the uh, uh, Ising pneumatic case, uh, this was a plus sign. So the relative coupling that you cover couplings on the two sides of the Fermi surface have the same sign for some scalar order parameter, broken symmetry, and opposite signs for the vector potential. So, but at this order for the large end limit, that actually makes no difference. But when you consider other operators, in particular, you consider the pairing instability, you consider two fermions at opposite ends and ask, can they pair up like in the BCS theory? So in the BCS theory, the opposite electrons have a pairing instability. So you can do a calculation here also of a pairing instability. Uh, and what you'll find is that the interaction uh, between these fermions at these two points. So if we take a fermion here, So if you take a fermion here uh, and a fermion here, and then you ask, they exchange a boson. Which boson? Well, this boson here that's destroying the quasi-particles. Can that boson cause an instability to a BCS state? Um, maybe I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and what you find then is that for the gauge field, this attraction between them for the U1 gauge field is repulsive. So in fact, the so this means like some the spin on Fermi surface state or the HLR state is actually stable, at least you know, over some regime of parameters uh, to, an inst to becoming unstable to superconductivity. So, that's, so there's this non-Fermi liquid state is, uh, is stable towards superconductivity. On the other hand, for the other case, for the pneumatic order parameter, it's unstable. It gives you an attractive interaction. And also one way you can understand, roughly speaking, why the interaction is repulsive. Uh, you can think of these two points as having a, you know, a current flowing this way, this is a current flowing that way. And then there's a transverse component of gauge field. Well, Ampere's law tells you that if you have currents flowing in opposite direction, they repel each other from the magnetic field. So that's why there is no, uh, no pairing instability here for the gauge field case. So the gauge field is actually good. It gives you a non-Fermi liquid more robustly than the other one. So yeah, let me just finish then uh, last two minutes. Uh, how do you compute this pairing instability? Well, in this critical state, well, again, you do it exactly the way it's been done uh, in the SYK model by Igor Klebanov and collaborators. Uh, you, you take in some pairing operator, two fermion operator, uh, and you compute its uh, scaling dimension by looking at this three-point vertex operator. Um, so this, this type of equation is exact in the large end limit. Uh, and when you write it down, you get an equation for this, uh, where did it go? You evaluate it and you get some uh, integral differential equation. Uh, and you look for solutions of these equations for some scaling dimension of your uh, pairing operator. Um, and when you get a real solution, well, that tells you the scaling dimension. But if you get an imaginary scaling dimension, that tells you there's an instability. So, and so you can do that type of calculation. And the beautiful thing is that the coupling G just drops out. There are some set of scaling dimensions and you just have to see when they're imagin imaginary, when they're, and that tells you when there's an instability to, to superconductivity. Uh, there can also be an instability to a charge density wave that's a bit more complicated equation that's not written down uh, over here. All right, so, okay. So I think I'll stop there. So, you know, in the last 10 minutes, uh, I've told you things which I hope represent progress to some of the, you know, the key open problems in this field. One is some understanding of the linear resistivity. And the other is a step towards understanding, you know, what is the critical temperature for high temperature superconductivity? You have some non-Fermi liquid state, which is going unstable to superconductivity. Uh, if this is, you know, this is one possible mechanism for the superconductivity, then uh, we have to understand more about, uh, you know, these kind of uh, 
diagrams to fully understand what's going on and what's DC. You're a long way from that, but uh, that those are certainly that's certainly a very important problem for future research. Okay, thank you very much. That's thank you very good. much. Thank you for the course. <laughs> so um, I suggest that if there are urgent question to Professor Sachdev. Uh, uh, let's do now, but then otherwise uh, we can do a break and we arrange for the discussion because uh, uh, Professor Scoutens will be answering from the from the room with the blackboard. So I suggest uh, if there are urgent questions, let's do it, but then let's take a, a break and we reconvene uh, with both Subir and the Karelian um, in 10 minutes. Do there are urgent questions? Otherwise, uh, please uh, keep them for the discussion session. Okay, maybe some rest is needed. So I suggest that in 10 minutes, uh, we start the discussion session. And this will be online and the Karelian will be on the blackboard here in Arcetri. Okay. So let's let's have a small break and then we reconvene. Thank you. 